So hello, welcome to another week. Today we're going to start chapter seven. Uh, chapter seven is all about optics and wave effects. You see, last chapter we talked about waves, including electromagnetic waves, light. And we're just kind of like, light's a wave, it moves at a set speed C, and that's kind of all we said. Um, this chapter, we're going to actually talk about how to work with light, how to work with optics, how to, to direct it to where we want to be. This is going to be the study of light waves and vision. Um, how you know lenses work, like my glasses, how mirrors work. Now, in general, optics has two subcategories. What is called geometrical optics, also known as ray optics, and what is called physical optics, also known as wave optics. The general idea is that geometrical optics or ray optics is you treat light as a ray. You say light travels in a straight line, just view at something until it hits a medium and bounces. This basically is treating light like a particle. We'll come back to that idea. But you just say, you know, light just moves in a straight line, it hits something, it reflects, that's all you need to worry about. And we're going to use this to explain things like reflection and refraction, aka how a mirror works and how a lens works. However, as we covered last chapter, we know light is a wave. Wave optics or physical optics is looking at the wave-like properties of light and saying how light affects is affected because of the fact it is a wave how things like interference patterns and polarization come into play. Um, it's a lot more complicated than ray optics, and we are going to do some bits of physical optics a little bit at the end of class on Wednesday. But we need to worry about both these ideas. That the geometrical or ray optics, well, really, if you do physical or wave optics, you could describe everything. It just gets stupidly complicated. And so for the most part, we're going to look at geometrical or ray optics to explain how light acts. And when we can't use it, we will get into the physical optics. Now, for the first bit, we want to talk about just reflection and refraction. At least reflection, you should know the word off the top of your head. You might not know a fraction right away. But the short version is light travels in a straight line until it hits something. And when I say something, I mean a boundary between materials. L light traveling in glass will travel in a straight line. Light traveling in water will travel in a straight line. Light is always traveling in a straight line until it hits a barrier between two materials. When light hits water, it can bend. When light hits a mirror, it can bend. But light travels in a straight line until it hits a until it goes from one material to another. And in ray optics. Um, that's basically what we're going to do. We're going to say light travels in a straight line until it hits a new medium. And we will draw light as vectors that we call rays. Well, basically, we'll just draw the, lights as, the light as straight lines. And we're not going to worry about wave funds. You can ignore that bit of that figure. But we'll just say it moves in a straight line. If it hits a medium, it can bend. And that's all we're going to do with it. Now, when light hits a medium, there are three things that can happen. Whenever it hits a medium, the first object is absorption, which is the light wave hits it, and all of the energy of the light turns to heat. This is like light being shined on like the asphalt and getting hot. We're not going to talk about absorption. It's just because in the conservation of energy, it's just the energy of the light, which we'll get into later on, will turn into thermal energy, like we covered last chapter, last chapter, two chapters ago. I know what I'm doing two chapters ago. Um, we're not really going to talk about that, though. That's not really the interesting bit. The other two things that could happen are reflection, like a mirror. That when light gets shined on a mirror, it just bounces off. That's reflection. And refraction. Refraction is when light hits a see-through thing, and it passes through. But when it hits a new material, it bends. Really, when light hits something, normally it's a little bit of all three. Normally, some light is absorbed, some reflects, some refracts. Um, that's the standard. But we're just going to talk about cases where it's kind of all one or the other, all reflection, all refraction, or so on. I don't know why my font size changed. OK? 
let's start with reflection. Now, reflection comes in two flavors, specular and diffuse. If you look at a mirror, and where's my laser pointer? It's right here. If I shine a laser, my laser pointer off a mirror, what's going to happen is it's going to bounce and make a nice. Okay. Um, where's that mirror go? I had a mirror here for doing this. I don't remember where I put it. Well, if I shine this laser pointer off like a mirror, the laser pointer will just bounce and hit something else. But if I shine it on like. This piece of paper, it just kind of glows and doesn't really, you know, I can see a slight reflection coming off of it, but not much, just kind of glowing in a spot. That is called diffuse reflection. Oh, ref reflection. So when light hits something that is not smooth, the light follows other laws we're going to cover with reflection, but each ray will bounce off in a slightly different direction. It'll kind of spread out. Specular reflection is when light hits a perfectly smooth surface, and all of the reflection goes in the same direction. It's basically light bouncing off a smooth surface or a not smooth surface. Now, when I shine light off this guy, you kind of get this weird, like, bright spot where it's all kind of going all over. But when I shine light off a mirror, you get to keep the dot going. We're only going to talk about specular reflection. We're going to assume our reflection off a smooth surface. Of note, if you have diffuse reflection, it will follow all the same laws. You just need to go to a microscopic level and figure out the shape of the surface at all points, which is a bitch. And we're not doing that. And as long as you have, well, in all cases, but looking at specular, but I said this is also true in diffuse, reflection follows the law of reflection. And what it says is that if you measure the income, the incident angle of light called theta i, and the incident angle, by the way, is always measured from the normal, the normal being a point perpendicular to the mirror. So if you have a mirror and you draw a line 90 degrees from it, that's what you want to measure your angle from. If you have light that shines on a mirror and it bounces in, if you measure the incident angle, what angle it comes in at, theta i, that will be the angle it reflects at. The basically what it what we're saying is the law of reflection. Why are you so weirdly messed up? I think it, this these slides are an issue. Is that the incident angle equals the reflected angle? That whatever angle light goes and hits a mirror, that is the angle it comes back out of. And that's what the law of reflection says. That's all it is. If I have my light rays and I make them reflect, the angle they reflect at equals the angle they came in at. Now, when I move this mirror, what I'm doing is I'm changing that angle. But like, let me just pause at a random spot. What I'll say is that if this is the surface, oops, I don't want that tool. If that's the surface of the mirror, let's try that straight. The normal is this line right here. And what you can see, I'm just looking at this one way here, is that this angle choo -choo, is equal to this angle. Because here's the light ray, here's the light ray. That's what the law of reflection says, is that the angle in equals the angle out. And you see that's true for all of these lines. When I start moving this mirror around, what I'm doing is I'm changing the incident angle, because I'm changing the angle it comes at. Where at. But by changing the incident angle, I change the reflected angle. Does that make sense? Now, when you want to cause reflection, you use a mule. And the most simple version of a mule is a flat mule, like I just had in this video. Um, and what it is, is you can actually use rays to figure out what an image in a mule looks like. See, if you look at a mule, what it looks like to you is that there is an image behind the mirror, the same distance away. That if you stand in front of the mirror, you see a second you. And the second you is, yeah, it looks like it's behind the mirror. All sorts of weird sci fi and fiction coming from this, like Alice in Wonderland through the looking glass. What, what you see is what is called an image. And to be more exact, what is called a virtual image. We'll come back to that term later on. What you're seeing is an image located behind. And the reason why is in our brain, we don't know. Well, 
our subconscious, we understand that light travels in a straight line. And our brain interprets light as always traveling in a straight line. But when light hits a mirror, it bends. Let's say someone is looking at a candle in a mirror from above, kind of like how I draw here. What I can say is that light from this candle goes from the candle to the mirror to your eye. And really, your eye is a range of values from the top of your eye to the bottom of your eye. So you could say it goes from the candle to the bottom of your eye, the candle, the mirror to the top of your eye. And as it goes, it will follow the law of reflection. The instant angle equals refracted angle. But our brains interpret light as traveling in a straight line. If you follow back the lines from your eye to where they meet, that is where it looks like to you the image is. That is where it looks like you saw it. It looks like you see the candle inside the mural. And it will always look like the image. God damn it. Stupid computer. I need to replace my computer. It'll always look like the image is as far behind the mural as the object was in front of it. And it'll always be unmagnified or look the same size. That if something looks this tall, it'll look this tall in the mural. It won't change size. It'll look virtual. Um, I'll come back to virtual in a second. And we'll look upright. It'll be upright because, you know, if something's pointing up, it will stay pointing up. It won't get like suddenly be inverted, won't be upside down. Now, this virtual idea is you what virtual means when we talk about virtual image, there's going to be two types of images, real images and virtual images. Real images are things you can focus on a screen that you can like if you have like a projector and you project an image up on the screen, that is a real image. A virtual image is something that cannot be projected on a screen. You can see it, but just can't be projected. And a flat mural will always call a virtual image. You can't project an image off a flat mural. You see it, but you can't project it. So yeah, it'll look the same size. It can't be projected and will always be upright. Fun thing with this. Let's say you want to look at your entire body in a mural. You'd probably think if you want to look at your entire body in a mural, you need a mural equal to your height. But actually see your entire body in a mirror, you only need a mirror half your height. The reason why is the law of angle of incident reflection. Sorry, the, ang the law of reflection. That if you have a mirror half your height and you look at the bottom of the mirror, you'll be able to see your feet. Now, I'm saying that images in a mirror are upright. That does not mean they are necessarily exactly the same. As you are well aware, in a mirror, there is a left-right reversal. That if you look at yourself in the mirror, any writing on your shirt will be backwards. The reason for the left-right reversal is the same general idea. Let's say someone looks at an arrow in a mirror. What we can do is we can draw lines from each part of the arrow to your eye. And what we'll say is we'll draw one line from, for example, the front of the arrow. And we'll say from the front of the arrow to the mirror to the eye. And as I do that, I'll follow the law of reflection. So the instant angle equals the refracted angle. And I'm going to do another line from the back of the arrow to the mirror to your eye. Once again, though, like I said before, what you see, what you your eye interprets is as if these lines were straight. And so this line to the back of the arrow, your eye is going to say it really should have been straight. This line to the front of the arrow, it's going to say this line should have really been straight. And so it's reversed from what you think it would be. That the image you see in the mirror is backwards. That's why it gets reversed. is because of the fact that what was closer to the mirror is still closer to the mirror due to the way these bend. And so everything will have a left-right reversal. Any questions, though? Now, this gets a lot more complicated if your mirror isn't flat. You see, you can curve a mirror. And by curving a mirror, you can do a lot of other effects. This is called spherical mirrors. 
And spherical mirrors are just mirrors that are part of a sphere. They're a segment of a sphere. And they come in two flavors, concave and convex. A concave mirror is also known as a converging mirror. And what it is is as if you're looking at the inside of a sphere. In a converging mirror or a concave mirror, what happens is that if you shine light on a converging mirror, it will reflect all of the light and converge it to one point. This right here is a concave mirror. That all of the light gets focused to an ex if parallel, sorry, if parallel light hits the mirror, all of the light is focused to a set point. That is what a converging mirror is. A convex mirror or a diverging mirror. What it does is when the light hits it, all the light bounces off. And it's as if the light all came from one point. That if I follow each of these rays inwards, I can say it looks as if all the light came from right here. And that if you shine parallel light on a diverging mirror or a convex mirror, all the light spreads out. Assuming once again, you shine parallel light. Now you're gonna have to keep track of these names. Um, easiest way I keep track of it is concave is like a cave. You're going inside the groove. That's what a concave mirror is. What happens though, when you look at a reflection in a convex or concave mirror, is it'll start to distort the image. That in a concave or convex mirror, not everything would necessarily look exactly the same. This video is me walking towards a concave mirror. So this is concave, this is the converging. Right now I'm upside down and kind of small. And as I walk towards it, I will eventually invert and be right side up. Sorry if I gotta figure out where I am. Right side up and really big. That was just me getting closer to this concave mural, that it goes and changes the size and changes whether something is upright or inverted. In a convex mural, as me walking towards it, my I'm always upright, but I'm always a bit, well, I can get real big when I get close, but I get a smaller than I should be when I'm far away that I look really small compared to what I should look in a flat mirror. They would distort the image in certain ways. And you can actually work out exactly how they will distort the mirrors. See, what we're gonna do when we talk about the mirrors is we are gonna define a few points. And the first is we're gonna say is that a spherical mirror is a piece of a sphere, which means we can view this as a piece of a circle. And we would de define the point C as the center of that circle. And we would define all as the radius of that circle. And I'll just say, if I have a piece of a concave mule, I'll just say that, C, yeah, C is where would, the center of the circle would be. C is a distance all away, all being the radius. And what I'll do is I will draw something called the principal axis. You see, there's a point V, and I'm never gonna talk about V again after this slide. So don't worry too much about V, but V will be the center of the spherical segment. Basically saying that if my whole thing is from there to there, it's right here. V is just, where's the middle of the piece? And if I draw a line from the middle of the piece through C, that is called the principal axis. The principal axis is just a line from the center of the mirror through the center of curvature. And we can do those two very important points to label. The first one is C, C being the center of curvature. And the other one is what is called the focal point, where the focal point is a distance away from V called the focal length. Lowercase f is the focal length, capital F is the focal point. It's kind of dumb, they have different names, but basically focal length is the distance, the focal point is that's the point. They really kind of can be used interchangeable. 
And what it is, is the focal point is where all light is directed towards. That when light hits a mirror, that is where it is focused, hence focal point. And the focal point is always defined as halfway to the radius, that it is halfway to C. If the radius of curvature of a mirror is two centimeters, the focal length is one centimeter. What that means is the distance from, if I say the focal, if I say the radius of curvature is two centimeters, that means the distance from here to here is two centimeters. And therefore the distance from here to here is one centimeter. That's the general idea. Any questions though? Now, when I say the, that it's foc the focal point is where the light is focused, I mean just like this diagram I had before, or this video, videos, I guess, I had before that. That when you have a concave mirror, if all of the light comes in parallel, the focal point is where the light will get centered to. That this spot right here is my focal point. And if I was to continue this circle, right, what I'd say is that would be the focal length and twice that is the radius of curvature. That this is a part of a sphere where that is the radius. Same idea here that this right here, C is the distance of the radius. And the focal point is just halfway. For a diverging lens or diverging mirror, sorry, I misspoke. Ah, did not mean to do that. Nope, not that either, this. For a diverging mirror, the focal point is where, if you follow the lines back, where they would have been focused on. Now note, C is always the center of the radius. And so that means for a diverging, C is going to be on the opposite side of the mirror as you're doing everything on. And the focal point is just going to be where the light came from. That if I once again follow these lines back to a set spot, the spot they all meet, that is the focal point. This right here is the focal point, with C being twice as far. Now, this is all assuming light is signed out perfectly parallel. But when you look at images, most things don't have parallel light. You only get parallel light when you make an effort to do so. Most things just put out light in all directions, kind of diverging like. And so when you look at an image in a mirror, spherical, flat, or otherwise, you can't assume all of the light is parallel. And so what we can do is we can use this idea of the focal length and the center of curvature to figure out exactly what something looks like when looked at through a curved mirror. Basically, I was saying that as I move around in this mirror, sometimes I'm upside down, sometimes I'm right side up. How can I tell that? Yes. Um, so is this like, you know, the Dark Side of the Moon, the uh, Pink Floyd album? Is that yeah, kind of was... that, that basically without the colors? The this... Yes. That, this, is not, that. this is I not, ref... like that is not a uh, <laughs> reflection. That is refraction. Oh, okay. We Thank will you. cover that with it's my the favorite colors. album. I have okay. two of their vinyls, the original. <laughs> okay. No, we will cover that. Um, I don't know if we'll get to it today, but if not, we'll get to it Wednesday. All right, thank you. No problem. So when you look at an image in a sphere spherical mural, you can figure out exactly what the image would look like. And there's a few ways to do it. One is a mathematical way. I am not going to give you the equations for the mathematical way. I actually don't know why I don't. They're very simple equations. But um, I'm going to just do the graphical method. And the graphical method is called a ray diagram. And what this says is if you want to look at what an object looks like after you see it through a um, spherical mirror, it's a way to show exactly, yeah, what it will look like. And what you do is, okay, I'm going to list the steps. And this slide is the steps. I've always thought just seeing these steps makes no sense to you see it done. So I'm just going to explain it once, but I'll show it. If it doesn't make sense, wait till I show it. Hopefully then it will. But what you do is you draw the mirror. 
and you mark where is the center of curvature, the point C, and where is the focal point, the point F. And then you draw your object as an arrow, an arrow starting from the principal axis to whatever height the object has, which really you can make it whatever height you want as long as it's smaller than the mirror. And you draw two lines, one coming from the top of the object to the um, so one coming from the top of the object to the mirror, then going straight through F. The other one going from the top of the object through C. And wherever they intersect, you draw another last arrow from the principal axis to where they meet. And that is what your image looks like. This is what I mean. Let's say I want to know what this image or this object looks like, or the image of this object looks like in this curved spherical mirror. So what I do is I draw the object just as an arrow. And I mark my focal point and my center of the mirror. And I will draw two lines. The first one goes straight across, then through F, like so. Then I make it parallel to the principal axis, then right through F. My second line goes through the center of curvature. Where they meet, that is my image. And I draw a little arrow to represent that. There's my little arrow from the principal axis to the point of meeting. And I can say that is my image. Now, when I look at this image, what I see is that it's pointing down and really small. This was a, um, con this was a converging mirror far away. Well, here's my video from the converging mirror far away. I was upside down. This shows why. Uh, now, to define a few terms, because I'm sometimes going to use this, DO is the object distance. DI is the image distance. Uh, DO is how far away the object is from the mirror. DI is how far the image is away from the mirror. It's how far it looks away. And that this image in the mirror will look upside down and will look a little closer. It will look a little smaller. It's just how far away the image is. I've also already hit on the idea that images can be real or virtual. As I said before, a real image is once that the rays converge and can be converged onto a screen. A real image is one that you can focus it onto a point. This is going to get complicated, especially when I get into lenses. But for a real image is one that the image is in front of the mirror. It is one that the image and you are on the same side of the mirror. Because that's how you use mirrors. You bounce things off them. This right here is a real image because the object is to the right of the mirror and the image is to the right of the mirror. They're on the same side. This can be focused. A virtual image is one that you can still see the image in the mirror. I'm going to spoil this from ahead, but just so you know. Um, this right here is actually going to be a virtual image, me getting real big in this mirror. We'll see that in a little bit. It doesn't mean you can't see it, but it means you cannot focus it on a screen. And that'll be anything the image shows up on the opposite side of a mirror. A concave mirror can be virtual or real. A convex mirror is always a virtual image. I will also often ask questions like, is it upright or inverted? That's the wrong weather. I should fix that. A, up, a upright image is one where the object and the image point in the same direction. A inverted object is when they point in opposite directions. This is an inverted image because the object was pointing up and the image is pointing down. It means that the image looked upside down. It was inverted. Images could also be magnified or reduced. A magnified image is one that looks bigger than it really is. This lady's eye in that is a magnified image. It looks bigger. Makeup mirrors are like this. A, a, a reduced image is one that looks smaller. Um, to really see the one that's very, very obvious reduced is this guy. This is reduced. It looks super small. 
Um, how does help magnified or reduce is you look at the size of the arrow. Well, I mean, literally, this arrow went from here to there. This one goes from here to here. This arrow is kind of tiny. That means it's reduced. Okay. Now, I'm going to do a few more examples, but before I do, I want to kind of make a point here. Um, your homework is going to have these on it. Uh, Vanco Hall cannot grade these. It does not really have the ability. What you're going to need to do for your homework is you're going to need to draw these raid diagrams on paper. What you'll then do is you will take pictures of them and upload them. I will grade them by hand and I will give partial credit. You're only going to have one attempt because of the way this works. But as I said, I will give partial credit. Um, you will need a ruler to do it. Make sure you have a ruler. I'm going to give everything in centimeters. You can work in centimeters here. Um, so I recommend having centimeters. But if you work in inches, I mean, I can't tell the scaling of the photo. Right. If you work in inches, it's just everything's off by 2.54 or factor 2.54. I won't be able to tell the difference. Um, but yeah, make sure you have a rule to do these. OK. Now, the example I did already. The example I did already was a concave mural where I was far away. And for the concave mirror that was far away, I had a reduced inverted image. All right. Let's do a concave mirror to get a quick of my face where I'm close to it. And as we can see here, for this one, I'm close to it. I'm upright and much bigger. We can see this with a ray diagram. So I'm going to do a ray diagram for this right here. I've already drawn F and C. Well, C is the race of curvature, F is halfway. And if I want to draw a ray diagram, I'm going to draw two lines, one from the top of the object through F, the other one from the top of the object through C. And what I'll do is say, wherever they meet, that's where my image is going to be. And I'll draw a line from my principal axis to that point. Although I feel like it's slightly off. I feel like that arrow. This is like just stolen from a textbook, but I feel like that arrow should really go down to heel and should be like heel. I don't know why they slightly put it off. It's weird. And so I can look at this and say that this is, that's what the image looks like. Now, this is a real image because it's on the same side of the mural. This is a magnified image because it's bigger. And it's an inverted image because it's pointing down. So I said before that I was upright. Um, that actually was not the right spot. This would be closer to like my hand heel, that my hand is getting super big, but is still upside down. Right about, yeah, like there-ish. OK? I forgot I did this one in here. I went straight to example three in my mind. If I get even closer, I can still do the same thing. I want to know what the image looks like from this. I draw two lines, one straight across through F, the other one from the top through C. But take a look at these lines. These lines are diverging. They're getting further and further apart. And if I extend them into the infinite, they're never going to connect. They're only going to get further and further apart. If you ever find that your lines cannot meet, Find where they meet anyways, which seems like an asshole sentence, but you get what I mean. They might never meet going that way, but I can continue them in the other direction. And if I continue these lines in the other direction, they meet way out here. And that's where my image is. This is a virtual image. A virtual image cannot be focused on a screen. However, a virtual image, like so, can still be seen. It is upright, as you can see, as magnified, and is virtual, once again, because on the opposite side. Any questions, though? OK, all of these were for a concave or converging mule. I've yet to do any with a convex mule. 
when you do a convex mule, what's going to happen? And this is not drawn to scale. F should be halfway to C. Once again, I saw this from the textbook. I don't like how F is definitely in C or not related. C should be like heel. I should fix that. For a convex lens, your center of curvature is still in the center, but you're looking at something shining off the outside. For a convex lens, your object will be on the opposite side as F and C. But you draw your two lines the same way. One straight across, then through F. One from the top of the object through C. And you draw your image from the principal axis to where they meet. And there you go. This is a virtual reduced upright. It is virtual because on the opposite side of the mirror as the, I think I said lens before by mistake. It's on the opposite side of the mirror as the um, object was. It is reduced because it's a lot smaller and it's upright because it's pointing up. Just like how it looks when I look here at my real life convex mirror. When I get close, it doesn't look too inverted. But when I get far, sorry, it doesn't get too uh, reduced. But when I get far away, it looks pretty reduced. Make sense? Now, I want to look at this image to the mirror I have on the side. Um, when you have a convex mirror, it does make things look smaller, but it also gives a larger range of area than a flat mirror that I can see further to my left and right in this picture. Uh, this is the basis of mirrors on your car with the objects in mirror closer than they appear. The reason for that is because we are adapted to understand that things that look smaller are further away. That the further away something is, you know, I can look out my window and look at the trees in the distance and the trees don't look very big. If I walk up to those trees, they look pretty goddamn big. Because we understand the small things look That's smaller awesome. further away. Um, I went uh, skydiving with my family, and I can tell you the perception of seeing the Earth clearly is round. Oh, yeah, yeah. Why people think it's flat. They just got to jump out of a plane. <laughs> Not everyone's willing to jump out of a plane is the reason. Yeah, it was my mom's idea. I don't know how she got it to do it, but hey, it was <laughs> awesome. Yep. On a call, call mules are convex. They're convex to show a bigger area like this, or at least the, the external mirrors. The your one inside your car is normally pretty flat. They're convex to show a bigger area so that you can see more things. Because they are convex, they make the image smaller. The image is shrunk down. That's why it says objects mirrors close than they appeal. It's because they are they should they should look bigger. It's just we have a curved mirror, a curved mirror, so you can see more. Any questions there? Nope. Okay. That is reflection. Once again, you're going to have to draw lens or mirror diagrams. The mirror diagrams, it'll be on the homework, it'll also be on the exam. Um, you just draw them on paper, send me photos, and answer questions about them. That's what happens when light bounces off a surface. But let's say instead of shining light on a mirror, I shine light at something that is see-through. That maybe instead of shining light on a mirror, I shine it on a piece of glass. When I start bending this glass around, what happens is the light, some of it will flex. Like if you look at this, I can see some reflection that some light is, this line's coming in, it's bouncing like that. But most of the light doesn't reflect, it bends. And as it enters, it bends. As it leaves, it bends again. This is called refraction. Oh, this is called refraction. Anytime light hits a medium, some does reflect, but most of it will refract. And what happens is it'll just change the angle the light is traveling at. Um, in this diagram to the left, you see refraction twice, when it goes from 1 to 3 and when it goes from 4 to 5. Light does not bend in the, it does not bend in the material. The light, when it's in this glass, travels in a nice straight line, that from here to here are straight lines. 
It only bends when it goes from one medium to another. It refracts when it enters the glass. It refracts when it leaves the glass. And if I start messing with this angle a little bit, I can change how much it refracts. That at the, that, yeah, the bigger the angle, the more you can see the bend. That's because the speed of light changes. Now, this seems dumb because I said last chapter at the speed, or two chapters ago, that this, no, last chapter, I said last chapter, the speed of light is three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. And I said that's always the speed of light. But it's kind of a stretch. That's the speed of light in a vacuum. You see, if light travels in a material, it gets slowed down a little bit, not much. And in fact, in air, it gets slowed down to like 2.998 times 10 to the eighth meters per second or something like that. It's just ever so slightly can get slowed down. And what happens is when light hits a new media, its speed will be slightly slowed down. When its speed gets slightly slowed down, also the reason, sorry, the reason its speed gets slightly slowed down is that its wavelength gets shortened. That the wavelength gets ever so slightly squished because it was just moving free wave. When it hits a material, it has resistance, those things it's moving in, and it just gets compressed a little bit. It's actually a little more complicated what happens there. Um, if I have a second, I'll. I probably won't show it today, but I'll show a video by Wednesday, go into more detail about that. Um, actually, I, we'll see. I might show the video, I might not. However, the frequency of the light does not change. And remember that wavelength times frequency is velocity. And so if the wavelength changes, but the F doesn't, that means V changes. And for any given material, we can say exactly what the speed of light is in it for that material. Although we do usually don't talk about the speed of light of the material, we talk about instead of the index of refraction, where the index of refraction uses the symbol n. And n, the index of refraction, is the speed of light in a vacuum, 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, divided by the speed of light in that material. Just like what is this? You know, the speed of light in water is two times ten to the eighth meters per second. Just trust me, that's what it is. And so I can say that you find the index of refraction of water, and so on. What I can say is that the speed of light in a vacuum, and so yeah, I'll just define n. Now n it has no units; it's a unitless value. And also, the c of m is always less than c, so the index of refraction must always be greater than one. Now, using this index of refraction, we can define exactly how much light bends. So what I have here is light being shined into water. And when it comes in straight at zero degrees, it comes out at zero degrees. But when I start bringing this to angles, if the light comes in at 30 degrees, it's coming out at just shy of 25. When it goes into the water at, I'm kind of stuck. When it goes into the water at a, like, 45 degrees, that's what I was stuck at. It comes out at like 35 degrees. And yeah, I can match what angle light comes in at all the way at 60 degrees, it comes out at 40 degrees, depending on the index of refraction. And mathematically, we can solve for that. We solve for it using something called Snell's law. Snell's law says, if we measure the angle from the normal, and you can see that this little guy did that, that zero degrees was straight up perpendicular to the water. If we measure the angle from the water, we would define the incident angle and the, reflect, the, the refracted angle. Now, instead of I and all, for some reason, they always use one and two here. So theta one is the incident way. That would be this angle right here, which you can see is 40 degrees. Theta 2 is the refracted angle, this angle right here, which you can see is like 30 degrees. And according to Snell's law, what Snell's law says is n1 sine theta 1 equals n2 sine theta 2. 
that if you know the index of refraction of the material and what angle the light hits it, you can find the angle the light leaves it just by using the sine and inverse sine of the angles. As long as you measure your angle from the normal, if you measure it from the surface, you're going to get it wrong. What this does is anytime light travels from a larger or smaller index of refraction to a higher index of refraction, such as going from air into glass or water into air, is that the angle will become smaller. That, let me, that when this enters the glass box, and let me draw my normal real fast. Uh, my normal is about that angle. Let me just move that into position. Is that the angle inside the glass is smaller than the angle before the glass because I'm going from a larger, a smaller value of n to a bigger value of n. It bends towards the normal. If instead, if instead when I leave the glass, if I go from a Low, if I go from a, um, yep. If I go, if I go and make n smaller, if I go from a larger n to a smaller n, it'll bend away from the normal. Now it's all good to say light bends when it hits the material, but it's kind of the question of why. And I can mathematically prove it. I can go through all the equations and show you. But um, back when I used to use a textbook for this class, the textbook had an example for this that is possibly the, um, the least mathematical, easiest way to understand this I've ever seen. And what it is, is let's say you have a mulching band. And this mulching band is, walk is mulching through a field. And they are mulching at a set pace all taking the exact same size steps and mulching in unison. The speed of those steps, that'll be the frequency. And wavelength will be equivalent of how big of a step they take. And they're all traveling at the same speed. Let's say they hit a region of mud, but they hit it at an angle. They don't all hit the mud at the same time. What we're going to have is these bagpipers. I don't know why the image used bagpipers. These bagpipers on the left hit the mud first. Because they hit the mud first, they're going to kind of get stuck. And to walk at the same pace or the same frequency, they're going to have to take smaller steps. Because they're going to take smaller steps, they're going to go a little slower. And if the people on the left go a little bit slower, but start going a little bit slower before the people on the right start going a little bit slower, what's going to happen is going to cause a bend in the path. That the people on the right heel are going to travel faster, longer. And so the light will bend. That is what's happening. This is why when you look at things in water, they'll often look disjointed. That like this pencil in the water looks like it's a break. That's because when light goes from the water to the air to your eye, it gets bent. It gets bent because it's changing the index of refraction. Also, if you ever want to find, if you're looking down at water and want to like go fishing, and you see a fish in the water, the fish is not where you see it because the light is refracted. It'll actually be bent from that. So um, in case you need it, here are some index of refractions. Um, there's some values. We're going to normally just use one for air. One really should only be a vacuum of space. But we normally use one for air because it's so goddamn close to one that within certainty it is, but other types of things have other index of refractions that will bend it different amounts. Um, I said I would play a video if I had time. I only have a minute. So yeah, I want to say I don't have time. Uh, if you want to watch this video on your own, you can. It's a short little video. It will explain um, it's minute physics, but it's definitely going to be longer. It's always longer than a minute, despite them calling themselves minute physics. No, paste. Um, come on, minute 41. Yeah, it's gonna be too short, but it'll explain a little bit how light bends. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I won't have time to actually play it in class. 
Um, but yeah, that's the idea of light bending. Now, how we can work with the light bending, different things we can do with the light bending, that is what's going to be on class on Wednesday. OK? Otherwise, that's it for today. Have a good day.